the topic about debt normally automatically means public debt. And if you take a look, for example, at the American economy, you can see, yes, public debt is rising in a way it hasn't done in the post-war period, and it's now at levels that weren't seen since the end of the Second World War, the demobilization period. So that's what's concerning policymakers, of course, particularly in America, but it's a global uh, focus. But when you include private debt in there as well, the picture changes somewhat. Yes, public debt's rising, but it's far smaller than the level of private debt. And in fact, the crisis began around about the time that private debt started to fall. And the rise in public debt came afterwards. So simply looking at this empirically, you have to ask which one matters, what's driving what. And when you take a look at that, you find, in fact, there's a negative correlation between the two. Rising public debt normally goes to falling private and vice versa. Of course, because private debt's been rising, we've normally seen falling public debt over the post-war period. And that correlation's been getting stronger. It was a fairly unimportant minus 0.35 uh, from 1955 right to now. But from 2005, now it's pretty significant, minus 0.88. And this gives you an idea of why. There's the relationship of the annual change in each of those debt levels, private debt and public debt. And I think now, notice I've now marked on the chart recession. That's the date that the NBER takes as the beginning of the crisis in America. The beginning of the, not the crisis, of course. We date the crisis from August 9, I think it was, 2007, when BNP shut down its subprime funds. But this is when the NBER recorded the recession is starting. Notice how closely that corresponds to the time at which the rate of growth of private debt dived from about plus 30% of GDP on an annualised basis to minus 20%. And you can see, as time's gone on, just how much more there's been a mirror image in the two debt patterns. And so which one drives which? So the correlation, now looking now with relationship with unemployment, here we find a correlation, a positive correlation between changes in government debt and the level of unemployment. Now, if I was a politician from the right in America, or the loony left for that matter, I might come out and say, oh, well, government debt causes rising unemployment. That's getting correlation and causation confused. Let's take a bit of a deeper look at it. The change in private debt has a negative correlation with unemployment. And I can think of the causal argument there, which I'll get to in a moment. Now let's put the two on the chart, look over time again. And you can see that as time goes on, that correlation between changes levels, changing in, in the rate of, oh, sorry, change, the change in private debt and the level of unemployment gets stronger and stronger. And the correlation with, with public debt and unemployment also gets stronger. Let's take a look at that stage by stage. What you can then interpret is that rising private debt correlates with falling government debt. Okay. And that rising private debt correlates with falling unemployment. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to have you know, rapid increases in, in private debt all the time, obviously, but we're talking about a, a correlation here. And then finally, rising unemployment correlates with rising government debt. And that's the fairly obvious causal relationship in the government side, that the government spending or deficit goes up when the economy slows down because tax receipts fall and welfare payments rise. That one at least should be fairly obvious. But let's take a look at these correlations stage by stage now. And I'm now looking at the, the correlation between change in government debt and change in private debt. And you find over the entire period, it's a not a particularly large, it's statistically significant, but not a large number, minus 0.35. The private debt to unemployment, minus 0.45, and the government debt to unemployment change are fairly strong, 0.72, for that 60-year uh, period. But those correlations have strengthened over time. Now, there's looking at uh, the private and uh, government debt change relationship over time. Back in, from, from 1955 right through to now, yes, it's a fairly small minus 0.35. But it rises, as you can see, almost monotonically, minus 0.49, minus 0.6, then minus 0.69, and finally, minus 0.88. So there's a very strong correlation now between changing levels of uh, private debt and changing levels of public debt, but they're moving in opposite directions. And when you break it down on a um, on a decade-by-decade -decade basis, say 55 to 65, it's a fairly low, minus 0.16. Equally, at that time, the level of private debt itself was very low compared to GDP. Mainly negative, one positive in there in the 85 to 95 period, trivial 95 to 2005, 
and then of course minus 0.88 from 2005 until today. Now looking at the, the, the relationship between private debt change and unemployment, that's also strengthened dramatically over time. So over the entire time period, the change in private debt correlated with, with the level of unemployment with a minus 0.45 correlation, then minus 0 0.55, 0 0.77, 0 0.86, 0 0.92, and finally minus 0.97 for the last eight years, which includes, of course, the prelude to the bust, not just the, the bust from 2008 on, but the boom that was still going on from 2005 to late 2007. And then again, looking on a decade-by-decade decade decade basis, that's normally been a negative correlation. Once and only once in the period 65 to 75 is there a positive correlation between the two. But throughout, this has been the trend and getting stronger over time. Now, what about government debt change and unemployment? That's been fairly consistent. Starts off at a fairly high level of 0.72, looking at the entire period from 55 to virtually, well, virtually 60 years. Uh, the, 0.72 then, 0.72 down a bit, then 0 0.83, 0 0.84, now 0.91. So again, we're seeing unemployment levels of what drives the government debt. I think that's pretty much a no-brainer to expect that to be what you get as out of range of causality with that one. And again, on a decade-by-decade -decade basis, that trend has been consistent all the way through, getting stronger as the level of private debt gets higher. Note, remember, for most of this period, government debt's been falling. So that data contradicts conventional economic theory because what, what I get is a set of empirical guidelines that I could derive just from looking at the data would be to say, first of all, change in private debt drives employment. Now, if you read, and I'll show you in a moment, Bernanke and Krugman on this point, they tell you there should be no correlation at all. So economic theory is telling us to ignore something which is blatantly obvious in the statistical data. The crisis itself clearly began when the rate of change of private debt turned negative. And the rise in government debt was in response to the rise in unemployment that was triggered by the collapse in the rate of growth of private debt. Now, conventional theory says that should not happen because from the point of view of normal neoclassical theory, private debt is simply an exchange between one agent and another type of agent where the change in the level of assets and, li and, and, li and liabilities are equally matched and therefore you can cancel them out at the aggregate level. And this is Bernanke from his essays on the Great Depression, talking about why he and other economists ignored Irving Fisher's arguments for debt deflation. Bernanke worked out a, a new Keynesian uh, implementation of something that resembles a debt deflationary process in that book, but he certainly dismissed the analysis that Fisher put forward in that 1933 paper. And he said the reason why debt deflation is no more than a redistribution from one group, debtors, to another group, creditors, now, I know some people in this room have specialised in bankruptcy. It's a bit strange to be told that during a uh, debt deflation, the debtors actually pay their debts, isn't it? They don't, of course. So even at a sensible level, one should be rejecting this proposition. But the argument was that with this redistribution in general, um, outside the period of a, of a financial crisis, uh, without huge differences between the marginal spending propensities of the creditor, creditor and debtor, Pure redistribution, which is how debt is seen, private debt is seen in this uh, neoclassical perspective, should have no significant macroeconomic impact. And the same thing is now being said by Krugman in his most recent book, End This Depression Now, to explain why the level of debt doesn't matter except during a period of zero interest rates. So you say ignoring the foreign component or looking at the world as a whole, the overall level of debt makes no difference. The aggregate net worth, one person's liability is another person's asset. And therefore, from that absolutely correct premise, he derives a proposition that the level of debt only matters if distribution matters. If there's some difference in the constraints applied to highly indebted agents than those that are applied to lowly indebted agents. Now, this is putting forward what we call the loanable funds model of, uh, of money, which has several components to it, but the essential point in this level, is that their lending doesn't change anything about the stock of money in the economy. And when Krugman modelled this with Eggerston, as he models it in his blog as well, he talks about lending between patient agents and impatient agents. So I'm now going to represent that vision 
in a banking, a model of a banking uh, system. And I'll be introducing you a bit more about this uh, later on. And so I'm putting a non-monetary model into a monetary framework, but showing what it means if we were in a modeling in a monetary way. And that is that lending is occurring between patient agents and inpatient agents who have both got bank accounts, which from the point of view of the bank are liabilities of the bank. The yeah, bank has assets, which are reserves, which are unchanged by the lending operation, and all the transactions occur on the liability side of the banking ledger. Now, I come from the perspective of endogenous money, and that says the banking sector actually can create money by lending. And the simple way to represent that is that the loans are done by not, not from non-bank to non-bank, which is the loanable the funds perspective, but from bank to non-bank. And therefore, the loans are occurring on the asset side of the ledger. And because of that, the assets rise and the liabilities rise and the amount of money in circulation, which are the liabilities of the banking sector, also rise. So when you do it that way, you then find the lending is now occurring from the asset side of the ledger to the liability side. That's really the only change I need to bring in to introduce why lending matters at the macroeconomic level. So the software I've just shown you a moment ago is a program called Minsky that's been developed financially with the help of the grant from MyNet. And um, further also, I've now got public funding for Kickstarter. I would be delighted to receive assistance from central banks who wanted to use monetary modelling. Please, if you'd like to help out, come and see me later. And it's, uh, it belongs to the family called System Dynamics uh, Programs, which includes programs like Simulink, Vensim, Stella, Vizsim. I know quite a few people in this room would have familiarity with that software, but I find it in neoclassical economists in general a profound ignorance of the very existence of this software. There was one prominent blog commentator uh, who uh, went to attack me on a Twitter discussion um, and then asked me, what, what did the wires do? As if I'd invented the idea of wiring equations together, which anybody who knows the history of systems dynamics know it began with Jay Forrester back in the, 19, uh, the, early, the late 1960s. And if you wanted to buy one of these programs from MATLAB or Mathematica, they'd charge you up to $20,000 for a copy. And he thought I was making obvious errors by putting these wires that he thought had all sorts of stupid lags in them. Anyway, that's a bit of an aside. Uh, but they, these programs derive algebraic and differential equation systems using the flowchart analogy for designing a model. And I've simply added a table of that which mimics the double entry bookkeeping of accountants. And what it lets you do is very easily construct explicitly monetary models. Now, that loanable funds model I showed you a moment ago, uh, showing it there, you notice that the reserves are the, are the, have got assets and then liabilities and then equity, the classic equation of accounting, and positive sums shown for transfers from and negative for recipients of assets shown as positive and liabilities shown as negative. And that means the program makes sure over here at all times that your row is sum to zero, which means you're not making an accounting error. And you can design extremely complex patterns of transaction between financial accounts using the software. And it supports multiple tables as well, as many as you want. And they're all inter interlinked as well. An asset in one can only be a liability in another and so on. And it, then it generates a system of differential equations from that basis. And that's part of what the software does. It then mimics the, re the remaining powers of standard models with the flowchart later on. So you define the flows themselves using the standard wiring together terms components, this is defining the wage, and what Minsky then does is convert that to an algebraic equation, and then the whole system puts together that way. And then you simulate, uh, at the moment we only support the runge carter algorithm, there's various others, Bolster algorithm and a range of others we'd hope to put in at some time, but that of course requires more financial support for my programmer. And you can analyze the system by outputting the equations in latex, all the equations you're seeing here are generated by Minsky, so you can self-documents. And you can link it into MATLAB. We generate the MATLAB code as well, so you can run the same simulations in MATLAB. And I said there's no limit to the complexity of the system beyond your own imagination. So we, and the, the limitations do, that do apply is I can only model a single sectoral economy, like a you know, widget economy, which is the standard thing that most all uh, economic models do. I have done models of multi-sectoral input-output dynamics in real time in a financial system in MathCAD and Mathematica. And we're now adding that capability or plan to add that to, to Minsky, which is a lot of programming. And also, ultimately, getting to the stage of enabling several countries to be modeled simultaneously, and therefore the financial flows between multiple 
countries and the fiscal flows as well. Now, I'll show you a sample of a, a small scale model of debt deflation at the end here. So let's go back and now take a look at that loanable funds model of, of uh, Krugman. This is putting his model in, in, in Minsky's terms. And if I bring that up and then simulate, whoops, double click on the wrong thing. There we go. And simulate this. I'll just change the scale a bit so the, the graphs turn up properly on screen. Uh, if I run the model, ah, inaccurate and pressing my keys here. If I run the model and drastically change the rate of lending or drastically change the rate of repayment, nothing really happens. The argument that lending doesn't matter at the aggregate level is correct if loanable funds is a correct vision of how the economy operates. Change those things as much as you like, you won't change much about the uh, apparent level of economic activity in that particular economy. Endogenous money, on the other hand, if I play with that the same way, and I'll try to be more accurate in my mouse clicks here, bring that model up, and then run that, and then change radically the rate of lending, or the rate of repayment, or the rate of interest, pardon me, the rate of repayment here, I have a drastic impact on the performance of the economy. And that's really the real world we've experienced. So we, have, we need to have a monetary theory of capitalism to really understand what we're living in and what we've been through recently. And the premier monetary theory is Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. Now, that starts with an economy in historical time, two things which are missing from neoclassical economics, history and time. I don't regard DSGE models as dynamic in any genuine sense of the word. So in historical time, looking back, you know there's been a debt-induced recession in the recent past, say the 1990s recession in America. Because of that crisis, everybody's conservative about the amount of debt they'll take on, both firms and banks. And therefore, only conservative projects are put forward for debt funding but because the economy has recovered, most of those projects succeed, which leads to both investors and bankers revising the risk premiums, accepting a higher level of debt and putting a higher valuation on assets. And as Mitski puts it in classic phrase, stability is destabilizing. A period of tranquil growth causes rising expectations, which is again very different to the neoclassical vision of how expectations are formed. Now, for a while, that's a good thing because the additional investment causes a higher rate of growth, which validates some of the risk being taken on. But ultimately, you get to the stage where Minsky describes expectations as not rational, but euphoric. And I'm sure anybody who's worked in the finance sector knows that's a fairly accurate description of the state of mind of players in the financial system when a boom is afoot. Now, in that situation, it's possible to make a profit by gambling on rising asset prices. The money supply has expanded, as I've shown you in the modelling so far, enabling riskier projects many of which are losing money while they're still going forward, but it's being papered over by borrowing more money to cover their debts. And that's where Ponzi financiers come in, who have a cash flow which is less than their debt servicing costs, but they profit by selling money on a rising market, at the same time as having a desperate demand for the debt now, because they're bankrupt. Only the fact that they're expanding and selling assets and getting money in to cover their losses until the next asset sale keeps them operating. Ultimately, the combination of, of losing projects being masked over, timing errors in, in getting refinancing, failures to get refinancing before you actually have to pay an instalment, rising interest rates cause a crisis. Uh, some, and a lot of times that can be just by an increase in the volume of sales on asset markets by firms that are responding to the high rate of interest that tends to prevail by liquidating assets into what they think is a very broad market. Now, of course, as soon as that happens, the asset market bubble ends. And as soon as that ends, the very first people to fold are the Ponzi's because they're already bankrupt to begin with. All it takes is a failure to roll over, roll over debt and their history because they can't sell assets anymore. There's a collapse in asset prices, increasing debt to equity ratios, and we're now back into the 2000s when I'm starting to talk about the dot-com bubble. Okay. So this is the pattern we tend to go through all the time. But Minsky's point about this is that if you, when the process restarts, it tends to restart from a high level of debt, and I'll show you why in a moment. Now, that means that you can get to the stage where in the final crisis, you've taken on so much debt 
that it overwhelms the servicing capacity of the economy and you collapse. But a government spending, part of Minsky's argument, was the government can stabilise that by giving firms a cash flow they wouldn't otherwise have when the private sector stops spending. Now, modelling that in Minsky, I began from a cyclical model of the economy built by Richard Goodwin back in 1967, which is very simple, starting with saying there's some sort of relationship between the level of capital stock and the level of output, so a simple linear is a good starting point. The level of output then determines employment, given labour productivity. That determines the employment rate, given population. That determines the rate of change of wages in the simple Phillips curve argument. Integrate the rate of change of wages and multiply it by the labour stock, you then have the wage bill. Subtract that from output, you have profit. In the simple model, Goodman had capitalists investing all their profit, so therefore you integrate uh, investment, which is profit, and you get the level of capital stock. And in a classic systems engineering basis, you've closed the loop and you can now simulate the mo model and what it gives you is permanent cycles. That's the starting point. The model is inherently cyclical. Capitalism is inherently cyclical. We have to start from a cyclical foundation rather than an equilibrium one to understand it properly. Having done that, I added debt inside there with a simple argument that capitalists don't invest all their profits. Mm. They invest more than their profits during a boom, in which case they have to borrow money, and less than their profits during a slump, in which case they can repay debt. But, of course, there's a tendency for that to ratchet up over time. And that's what incurs, as you'll see. So when I model this in Minsky, and this was actually quite scary for me to work out, I've normally used nonlinear functions. But I thought to get around the argument I get from some neoclassicals that believe everything I get in terms of dynamics comes out of using exponential relationships. I built them with a strictly linear investment function as well as a strictly linear Phillips curve, and I investigated this eigenvalues for its stability of equilibrium. It was unstable for all parameter values and all initial conditions. And that implies that maybe this instability is completely inherent. We simply have to accept that a capitalist economy will have rising debt to income over time. Notice also the pattern that's going on here. This is, this is the rate of profit here. This is the employment rate. Diminishing cycles for a while and then increasing, okay. which is the great moderation followed by the great recession. Now, I could simulate that. I'll show a, a non-linear version later, but I wanted to show that first of all to emphasise the point that the results I'm showing are not coming out of not imposing exponential behavioural functions. It's coming out of the actual structure of the economy. So you get a great moderation and a great recession, and there are two equilibria. In the more general model, you can get nonlinear stability around a, uh, an unstable point. Uh, and the, the, there's a good equilibria with positive wage of share, positive employment, and finite debt. That's where you'd like the economy to end up or to rotate around. But there's a bad one as well with zero wage of share, zero employment, and infinite debt. And you can see what happened in 2007 as a collapse towards that bad equilibrium. This is a nonlinear version of the model now. You can see those spiraling in and then starting to cycle out the other side. This is the rate of profit over here, rate of employment, the same sort of thing, diminishing cycles and then expanding. So we're collapsing into that bad equilibrium. What do you do in that bad equilibrium? Well, some mathematicians, uh, Grisselli and Costa Lima, have shown that the, the bad equilibrium can be made to be locally unstable, which is what you want. You want to move away from the bad equilibrium. If and only if the minimum growth rate is less than the real interest rate. Now, what does that mean? Well, the minimum growth rate is the level of investment you'll get if profits are minus infinity. I think you can pretty much take that to be zero. Okay? Minus the depreciation rate, which we know is positive. They have to be less than the real interest rate. Now, what that implies is if you wanted to use negative interest rate policies to stimulate the economy out of this, you'd need to have not merely negative, but lower than the negative at the rate of depreciation, at least minus 2%, minus 3% of that level. But if you wanted to do it by policy, fiscal policy, you need a stimulus. And austerity actually makes the, that, debt, that bad equilibrium stronger. It makes it more likely to fall into the hole, which, of course, is what Europe is finding out the hard way right now. So we need a model of how do we integrate we, we, to understand what to do, we have to integrate a private sector and a government sector model together. And that can't be done by neoclassical economics. The absence of banks is a pretty good starting point as being unable to model financial flows. Now, there's now a new subgroup of non-conventional economists called modern monetary theory, and they're provided part of that by talking about the relationship between government money creation and the private economy 
we need to include both forms of government money creation. And I'm going to show you a very simplified framework for that now with an extremely simplified treasury where the central bank simply lends whatever treasury wants. I know that's not exactly what happens, but it's a, you know, the extreme of what could happen and how in that particular relationship. And I then add that to a private banking model, just like the ones I've shown with, with endogenous money earlier. So very, very simple relationship. Government spending increases the loans level and increases a reserve, shown as a negative here. The private banking sector, of course, the same operations give you a positive in terms of the reserves being created over there. And the reserves turn up as spending on firms and spending on workers and wage subsidies and so on. So that's the relationships there. Now, Minsky generates the equations that come out of that um, using all the flow charts so I've shown you uh, beforehand plus the, the tables themselves. And if I do that, I haven't yet simulated this numerically, but what I get is these relationships being generated by the software. The one I want to focus on is the very bottom one. The change in the level of money is the sum of the net lending by the private sector and the deficit of the government. Now, that therefore means that the government can run a deficit to counteract deleveraging by the private sector, but it may not be enough because private sector deleveraging can exceed the rate of growth of the deficit. Okay. So it isn't, it isn't a straight negative that the deficit is the negative of net lending, which is I think some people think that it's not because with the capacity for the money supply to expand or contract, those two affect each other, but they're not lockstep. They're in interdependent, but one is not dependent on the other. So that implies that if there's deleveraging going on by the private sector, which reduces money in the economy, then the government should go in the opposite direction. It should run a deficit, not run austerity, because that would mean you have two... If austerity is run, there are two entities taking money out of the economy. Is it any wonder that it collapses? So you can re reduce the impact of deleveraging, but not prevent it by running a deficit, unless you run a gigantic deficit, and that's bigger than the ones that Japan's been running, which it hasn't been willing to do. Political problems get in the way. So I think... From this point of view, we can understand the huge difference between what's happened with America and what's happened with Europe, because even though America talks austerity, it's run a fairly substantial deficit, whereas the Europeans have actually imposed austerity, and we've seen the impact very brutally on the two. And I can now make a bit of a comparison about how does this particular period compare to the Great Depression. Using my analysis, I'm not explaining it in this, in this statement I do in my paper, that I see aggregate demand as a sum of income plus the change in debt. That's a heuristic. I'll elaborate the mathematics in later papers. But looking back with that perspective, what matters is the percentage of demand being financed by new debt creation. And if you go back to the 1920s, the maximum level of debt finance demand was in 1928, roughly equivalent to 8% of GDP, which is here. It then fell to minus 25% of GDP for an extended period, rose up again, a period of rising private debt here, back into deleveraging and then rising debt once more that goes much more dramatic, of course, during the Second World War. This is now adding in the government's impact. The gap between the two curves is the net debt creation, debt money creation by the, by the government sector. It's net deficit. And that is what we call the New Deal. Now, notice also that the gap between the two lines closes. That's Roosevelt being convinced he has to go back to balancing the books once more and the economy collapses because I think it provoked more deleveraging by the private sector again. Unemployment, which had fallen from 25% here to 11% here, blew out to 20% again during that period. That's a real example of what goes wrong if you impose austerity when you've still got deleveraging happening by the private sector. Now, that curve that has just turned up there is the current situation. Starting from 2008, the level of private debt financed demand was 22% of GDP far bigger than back in the Great Depression. Then a much more rapid decline down to much the same level of deleveraging, but a very rapid bounce out of it. So it was a more severe downturn than the Great Depression. Adding on the government sector partly explains why the, why the difference occurred, because the government was running already running a deficit to begin with, and that was the scale of the deficit, the peak scale of the deficit during the Obama stimulus, much bigger than the New Deal, not because of deliberate policy, but because of the, simple, the automatic stabilizers effect, given how much bigger government is now than it was back in the Great Depression. So I think that's a fairly strong cautionary tale about imposing austerity during a period like we're going through right now. It could renew, as it did back in the 1930s, returns back to deleveraging once more.
So some takeaway points from this. You, even though public debt is high, you need government monetary injections to reduce the damage of private sector deleveraging. Now, a better method, from my point of view, would be actually directing that money into private bank accounts under conditions that would impose the pay down of debt. We have to reduce the level of private debt uh, and also compensate those who are not in debt given the extent to which securitised uh, assets have been sold to the public sector. Now, the IMF is now saying it should have done this a lot earlier in Greece and it didn't do it for political reasons. My idea of a modern debt jubilee is very similar to what the IMF said it should have done but didn't earlier on. And the power exists. I don't know about most uh, countries reserve acts, but section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act allows the Federal Reserve to inject money directly into private bank accounts. We should use that as a way of, I'm getting a, a shake heads from there, Francis Holt, but I'm pretty certain that's 13.3. Pardon? If they actually lost it, that's one of the really big mistakes we've made recently, taking that away. We have to do something that enables us to deliver more rapidly. And, to, and also, in terms of economic theory, we have to finally stop being cowards which I really think the profession has been for the last century, and start explicitly modelling money. It's insane that economists model the economy as if banks' debt and money don't exist. That's what it enables you to do. And as I said, just input the relationships on a table, it generates the equations for you, you've got, and you link that physical system, you've got a model of a monetary economy. And I hope I can run this here, let's see. And this is a model of debt deflation, including in my financial sector, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I just suggest before I'll let this run out on the screen and then I'll, then I'll shut it down and recording this. Uh, so you can see the rising level of debt, great moderation, apparent reducing inflation, and then a collapse. <laughs>